Sarah Z. Short is a collage artist and printmaker, creating from her Driftway studio in the woods of Rhode Island. Her background as an English teacher may explain her love of books. From the covers to the well-turned pages, these are her materials of choice for her work. The tactile touch of paper and wooden type appeal to her as she combines found paper and ephemera, repurposing the stories of the past in her contemporary art practice. Sarah adds typography to her compositions using letterpress printing, choosing wooden type pieces based not on the words she could create, but on the shapes they made when printed. Beginning many of her pieces by printing with vintage wooden type blocks on rescued pages from discarded books, the prints are then abstracted in collage compositions to render the original forms unrecognisable. Working primarily with these vintage materials, Sarah loves the ragged edges of a worn book cover, the marks of time left by readers from the past, and Sarah can often be found rummaging through forgotten scraps of paper on shelves in basements for materials long forgotten or needed. The finding can be as engaging as the making, each unique piece influencing the composition's path. Her artworks result from how the materials respond to being salvaged and repurposed, reimagining how the discarded and overlooked can be beautiful once again, urging the viewer to lean in to observe the small details left behind. It is always about the shape. No images are present here, and by not getting caught up in the words, Sarah is concerned with the spaces in between. Bold, graphic, structured, layered, ordered, yet playful. Sliced and torn narratives from the past reconstructed in a new form. Sarah orchestrates the sliced up fonts to dance together and apart. Sarah's collages and prints can be found on her website, in galleries and as licensed prints. Her work has been published in print and online magazines and her abstracted typography stencil is part of the Stencil Girl collection. So let's find out more about what we can discover by working with repurposed materials, the spaces in between, and how the motion of making is the inspiration. We welcome you wherever you are joining us from, and Sarah Z. Short, this week's Friday Feature Artist. Hello, Hello and welcome. <laughs> Gosh, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Our pleasure. Like the longest uh, two and a half to three minutes that there could possibly be, it seems, when you're waiting. Um, so firstly, welcome, everyone. Um, it's fabulous to be back here for Friday Feature Artist Talks. And we are pre-recording this today, but we'd still love to hear from you. Tell us in the comments below where you're tuning in from. Um, and if you have any comments or questions, we'd love to try and get back to you as well. So yes, welcome everyone. We do appreciate you tuning into this. So Sarah, I mean, you know, there's, there is something sort of definitely that you connect with and to when you look at all those um, beautiful repurposed um, materials. So let's jump in. Um, I mentioned that uh, you had a past life as an English teacher. So how did you make the step um, from that to an artist working with collage? Was it always something that you did on the side? Did you tiptoe into the art world or just jump in? Uh, a little bit of both. It was a, a lifetime of tiptoeing around art. <laughs> and then when I was in the classroom, I was a middle school English teacher and I always would bring pro art projects uh, as part of um, what I was doing. And often it was collage. So I think that probably got me started a few collage classes that I took. And then uh, during the COVID years, I needed a creative outlet and that ended up being collage. And I just learned that you could tear up books and turn them into collage material. And once I wrap my head around that, I haven't stopped since. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I personally, for me, there is just something tactile about that and it's just so easily accessible. Like I get that sometimes people can be frozen, but on the other hand, it completely gets rid of that. I can't draw, I don't know where to start because like you say, you just rip and you've got something to start with and mm -hmm. you just kind of build from that really. And so 
did you have any like creative influences or artists that inspired you either like collage artists themselves or something that kind of um yeah put you on put you on your yeah radar? it was um the classes that I took with Melinda Tidwell and she had I think two online classes and they were all about reusing books but also the elements of design and design principles and mm -hmm. that made all of the difference between me just randomly gluing things down and playing with a uh, you know, jelly prints to understanding how to construct a collage so that it was more of a work of art and less just a mixed media experiment. So yeah. Melinda, Melinda changed everything for me. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. And did you feel that you had to go back in history and look at other collage artists or contemporary ones as well? Or was that a bit too like confusing? And um, no, I my art book collection grows on a weekly basis as I find more artists to be inspired by. But uh, Kurt Schwitters and uh, Rauschenberg and uh, let's see, Anne Ryan, another one. Um, I saw her collages in person and I hadn't known about her. And just she works. Um, everything is in these little squares and just these found papers layered. And those are beautiful to see and the textures and the colors and uh i have to put that on my list too um, yeah she i have a hard time finding any references to her besides the museum of modern art uh exhibit that i think is still up now but she doesn't seem to often show up in the textbooks as many women artists tend not yeah to. yeah um, yeah her work is lovely and oh gosh um yeah, it is amazing. I remember years ago before the pandemic and I happened to be in Edinburgh and, of course, went to the local gallery and at the time there was 400 years of collage as an exhibition that was on and, it, you know, and you just kind of go, okay, yeah, like I'm there. Um, and to go back to, you know, it was kind of like a dark room where they had stuff from way back, you know, the 400-year one. But wow. it is something that was quite like, wow, so people have been doing this for a long time. I, in those cases, it was sort of cutting out really fiddly little tiny bits and things. But, um, yeah, it can be quite a varied sort of um, area really. Um, yeah, it is. is. It is from the more realistic and like the Rex Ray collages that are so graphic to yeah. the, th the things that I've been doing lately that are so minimalist that it's hard to tell what I'm what materials I'm using. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. Um, and so this wooden block uh, type, you know, yes, I, you had me there with just, I mean, so much fun. Yeah, I, I have a little personal collection of um, wooden blocks, but I think I was, I was saying to you when we met earlier, um, I'd kind of just use them as sort of objects and, um, uh photograph them and just kind of you know stroke them and touch them rather than um knowing, what to, <laughs> knowing what to actually do with them and so i've just uh i'll try and put up some images here um if people yeah that mm. that kind of thing so you've got the old wooden type blocks that they used to use back in the day for um printing so um I think I asked you this when we were talking, do you have the fancy machine? That um, how, how do you use them? So I started collect, I took a printmaking class at Rhode Island School of Design and got to, and this was 20 years ago, I think, and got to use all the big presses. And then what do you do with it? Because most of us don't have the space or the money to have yeah. all those presses. So there was this little company called uh, Provisional Press and they started manufacturing these proof press kits that they send you all the parts, you put it together, and then you can print it home. So you have this little, like the one that you just showed, uh, it's a, a smaller, more handmade version than that. So once I had my hands on that little press, I just started collecting type and more type and more type. And I soon outgrew that press, so had to get a real vintage proof press. But it it's pretty much exactly the same thing as what I started with. Um, but I can 
now use larger letters. So the, the 10 or the 12 inch wooden letters, which allow me to make the much larger compositions like the blue one that's kind of floating in the back behind me. Yeah, yeah, right. And you sent me the image of that. Um, oh, there it is. Yes, it's adorable. Yeah. And so what a great thing. So was that happening anyway before the pandemic or was that just kind of like a pivoting thing of something that they thought that people might, might need? I think it started as a way, it might have been a, a pandemic creation, but mm -hmm. it was definitely a way to bring printmaking into the classroom. Yeah. And you know, it was such a dying art form, but a little press like that in an art class in a middle school could make all the difference about keeping printmaking alive. Yeah, 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 so true. Um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I'm sort of thinking, oh, yeah, the, you know, the, the students can assemble them and then it just, there's something so DIY amazing uh -huh. about that. Um, and so is that the top view of the time? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, and are you using ink on the blocks or paint? I am using acrylic paint, which I don't yeah. think is what most printmakers would use. Yeah. But because I'm then really cutting everything apart and then using matte medium with it and collaging with it, I wanted to make sure I had something that would be absorbed into the paper and dry quickly and then not be oil-based to cause problems later when I was mm -hmm. in these. So I do use acrylic paint. I just clean the type very carefully when I'm done. To yeah. Oh, my it. goodness. Yeah, it's amazing how I mean, people often say to me, when you use um, paint on fabric, um, you know, do you have to like set it and mix it with stuff? And you kind of go, it's so hard to get out of a surface that, <laughs> that setting it into a surface is often not the problem. Exactly. I know you don't worry about it. I know when I use fabric, I often I will letterpress print fabric and right. yeah, it's messy, but the acrylic paint works on fabric and dries nicely and I yeah. don't yeah. have to set it or do anything to it. And in just case for the folks playing at home, and so do you need to mix it with anything to stop it drying so quickly while you set it up on the press anyway? If I'm using golden opens, uh, they have such a slow drying time that yeah. I don't have to do anything. Uh, I sometimes use the So Flat from Golden, and that has, I use the Open Extender, mixing that in a little bit to slow the dry time. But mm -hmm. it, it's just a quick process, so I I, I don't... I'm yeah, no, that is really use any paint. Yeah, yeah. And I know what you mean with the printmaking inks because um, sometimes you kind of like get your finger and you're trying to just sort of see if they're still wet and you just kind of want to chop things up and stick them and they can take a long time to dry and then depending on where people are with um, temperature and all of that. So, yeah. Yes. And um, I think also uh, printing on vintage paper, it's it you can't control the the weight of it and what it's made out of so trying to use ink sometimes it absorbs sometimes it would be stay wet forever so using acrylic mm -hmm. paint mm -hmm. use that mm -hmm. out of and there's like a real rookie error there's nothing worse than having something assembled and then putting medium on it at the end and it all just sort of moves like I've had that happen mm -hmm. with charcoal or whatever and uh Yes. Oh, that can be frustrating. Yeah, that just beautiful thing just smearing across the surface. <laughs> Nasty. Yes. Um, and I've got this image of this press. Was this what you moved to after the provisional one? Or it is. That's my my Nolan. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So obviously that's a sort of countertop desktopy type um, version. Mm -hmm. But it looks yeah. the same as the the wooden one I started with. So it yeah, hasn't yeah. travelled far. Yeah, and I love that kind of utilitarian thing. Sometimes we can get so fussy and then it's just nice to, um, uh, yeah, I'm lucky to have a press as well. And when I was looking at it, I just wanted something really quite simple that, you know, none of those mechanical things that were going to sort of um, error over time. Exactly. Mm. Right. The, the printing is such a small part of it and then I still have the collage to do. So it, it needs to be fast and easy. Yeah, yeah, true. I just have to show another uh, close-up of um, so here we can see a uh, yeah, sans serif font. Um, do you have particular um, favorite fonts or particular letters that you enjoy working with? Uh, I mostly look for 
I like big blocky type. Yeah, right. Because it works better when I'm cutting it up so that it's really hard to tell how what it started as. So I also buy, I don't buy full sets of type. I only buy the orphans. So you never know what you're going to get in a set. And I don't have a particular font that I look for. I tend to look for um, letters that have interesting space in them or an interesting shape to them so that when I eventually cut it up, it will be more interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. And um, has it got harder or easier over time to find the wooden type? It's always a hunt. It's... <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of metal type out there there's a lot of tiny metal type oh, but to yeah. find the, the large poster size pieces is challenging so I'm always in Facebook market group marketplace groups and eBay and Etsy yeah. everywhere and then you know try not to buy all of the type because <laughs> I may have so much room to store it alert 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 mm -hmm. um and so you mentioned storage. Uh, is this in your lovely studio? Yes, that is my uh, cabinet of furniture that I use when I'm uh, setting up the press to lock everything in and keep it in place. And again, that was just something I happened to come across being sold at a, by a local vintage dealer and wow. had to get it immediately, even though I don't use it as much as I should. Mm, no, I'm having envy there. When I said I had a collection, mine basically fits in a shoebox. So that's just no, a that's tiny part. <laughs> Once you get the press that you use it on, then you'll have cabinets and cabinets full of type. Mm, yes, yes, yes. And so um, I've got a picture of your lovely studio as well. Um, just it's always nice to put the put the artist in the space and just. Uh, so is that your basement studio there? It is. You can see the, the insulation coming down from the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, always a challenge to find enough lighting down there, but the space is huge. So I can spread out and have lots of tables and different areas. And yeah. it's my home, so I can just come up and down and Fantastic. it's convenient. And do you find that you're working on more than one piece at a time? Not usually. I... <laughs> Well, no, I don't. I just work on one till it's done. And when I feel like it's done, put it aside and start something else. And I, I don't often go back and revise what I've finished, except with some of the larger pieces. I will rework those. But the smaller ones, um, the works on paper, I'll do those in the span of a few hours. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So I have this image, but uh, I guess that's more about the printing rather than assembling. Um, yeah, that, those are um, some postcards I had printed and I was just playing with the how I could layer the shapes into that small area to make them interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it, that um, the overlap and then the bleeding off the edge, like just... Um, exactly. It, it's so interesting what happens at the edges. And so, mm -hmm. as you say, that's the um, acrylic paint on the wooden letter forms. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, lovely. And I love that um, that texture that, <laughs> that you just get with um, contact on um, a surface. It's just yes. a great thing. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've got a, an assortment of questions. So this um, idea of working with repurposed per repurpose materials, um, what do you enjoy working with as far as repurposed materials go? And how do you determine whether it's going to be chopped up or repurposed, not used or kept? Uh, um, let's see. So just like with hunting for letterpress type, I'm always hunting for paper. So I have my go-to places for books and ephemera. And I, I just collect it all and... I think I decide if I want to rip it up based on how how old it is and if there's any value. So if it's an old book, I will usually look up the value online before I cut into it, just in case it's particularly <laughs> valuable. But a lot of times they are just so beautiful as objects that it goes onto the shelf and I won't touch it. But I've over time gotten more comfortable with just 
getting a stack of books, flipping through them, and then deciding that they're all going to get uh, torn and reused. But I also am interested in finding other types of papers that are uh, like player piano rolls, for example. Yes. Yeah. Those are fascinating. Uh, maps. I recently acquired a very large quantity of uh, bound plat maps that are fabric on one side and then the map on the other. Mm. And those are what I'm using in my current work because I, the fabric peels off. So then I have the map and the fabric to use separately. Literally, so two, just two for one deal. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think when we were chatting earlier, you mentioned to me that, um, you know, sometimes there's that element of thinking about if it has worth for someone else. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting thing. Like, okay, I can chop this up, but would someone else, you know, get a purpose or worth from it? And then, uh, and then if not, then yes, let's, uh, let's use it. Yeah, that's right. Really like cool. I have all these beautiful letter press printed pieces that came from uh, the Boston music scene in the like 1800s and I know I'll never rip those up because for someone they have names on them and right. they're very yeah. personal and they're just they're just treasures so I do have a very large collection of paper treasures that will never get ripped up right yeah yeah that is interesting and I've got the uh the box of materials uh, yeah <laughs> the very piano rolls going down into the studio yeah, there is something so attractive about that. And I do have a friend once who ironed out, you know, masks because they, they do roll up, mm -hmm. don't they? They do. Um, so that can be frustrating. Yeah, so she spent ages ironing them all up and converting them to, you know, sort of like letter size um, sheets. So, um, yeah, sure. that's a lot of dedication right there. It is. Um, yeah. And they do have that waxy surface on them, so I would think the ironing would really do a lot to smooth them out yeah that's maybe that's kind of like some sort of uh, meditative therapy mm -hmm. or something yeah so let's hone in on um I can see a little piece there yeah so, yeah <laughs> I like it because you can I don't like words to be visible that often in what I'm creating so using the player piano role lets you see a little bit of the text that's hidden underneath but not enough that you can read what it is yeah, yeah. And I love that little torn corner, um, sort of middle bottom there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm assuming that it came like that, that it was already torn, uh, sort of folded. And, yes. Uh, you incorporated and I just that. left it that way because it's how the paper wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. And so do you kind of find that um, you're hunting for those little elements and then working out where to go? Or sometimes is it like the serendipity and happenstance of where those pieces land in a, in one way? Like, I think I always, I mean, I have, a, I have one bin of papers where I keep all the ones that I think are really interesting. <laughs> so there, and actually that collage that you just showed, I think the entire collage came out of that one bin of the interesting <laughs> papers. Yeah. So you know, the, the ones that I tuck in there because they have the folds or the interesting writing. And yeah. Yeah. I just happen to use a lot of them in one piece. But for the most part, it tends to just happen accidentally I just have stacks and stacks of papers and I'll start pulling them out and if I notice that there's something good I'll try to keep that as part of the collage mm -hmm. yeah because like with that um in the bottom right hand corner where we see that number with the the diagonal strokes like you wouldn't necessarily know at the beginning that that was going to end up there but then right. yeah you've already selected it and you know it's going to go somewhere um, right yeah. And then, you know, um, are you responding to, like, is it sort of a process driven process that you've got one piece and then you're responding to what that piece is like, and then you're adding a piece in response to that? Is that kind of how you build yes, it? Yes, because I don't plan out my compositions in advance. It's just finding, I start with a piece of paper I like, I glue that down, and then it just builds from there. And if I find something that has 
like that little folded corner, then I'll try to either find another element like that to add somewhere else or create it myself so that it it balances through the composition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, two questions. So one, um, we're going with the sort of treasure thing, um, in that top right hand corner, you've got some like um, scrolly text and something else that looks like it might have been a ledger or something. And I was thinking, um, you know, has there ever been an instance where you've been drawn into the story of someone's like, you know, either their life from what you can read, from what you can find, or um, yeah, do you sort of imagine a story, like the actual story versus imagining the story? I do because I was an English teacher and then also have a degree in creative writing. So I find these pieces of paper and will often, will always read them. And I have, I don't think it's in here. I found this wonderful letter, for example, where I assume it was a man who was writing this, this explanation of how a school had burned down. And I think he phrased it. I know things ended badly between us, but I wanted to, I thought you wanted to know this. So of course my mind starts thinking, okay, so what if now she's writing back to him after he shares this news and where does the story go? So yes, I, I do sometimes continue the story that I see in the materials, but I, I cover them up when I am making the piece because I don't want mm -hmm. the words to distract the person who's looking at the collage. Yeah, yeah. And that can be tempting, that idea of creating art that has, uh, you know, sort of meaning or social commentary and right. often then people are selecting words based on the messages that they're trying to communicate. Yeah. But then, I don't know, maybe those pieces aren't always as timeless, but maybe then they witness a period in history. But... Yeah, I can also relate to um, just wanting to get rid of all that completely and just um, have it for the, the imagery itself. Mm. Right. I also think that it's it's not a kindness to the person who wrote that letter so long ago to then yeah. put it into a piece for people to look at when it was supposed to be private to begin with. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's well. something nice about just the... Um, the imagining and the hint, the hint of it, like we can see, looks like it says uh, 1892 on that mm -hmm. um, piece there or the signatures. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of just wondering enough about um, what that person's life was like. Exactly. And, Without giving it all away. Yeah. And so you mentioned G, the glue word, earlier. And so <laughs> I know that um, as we start to sort of see uh, your work here and I've got some other pieces as well, um, I know people will want to know, like, what are your substrates that you're using and then what glues, paste mediums are you using to um, work with? So my works on paper are usually on a watercolour paper and occasionally a printmaking paper because I like the texture of it. And my larger pieces are all on cradled panel. Mm -hmm. And matte medium, golden matte medium, is used in huge quantities for <laughs> everything. <laughs> and I think sometimes I'll use the heavy gel if it's a really uh, heavyweight paper, but usually matte medium will take care of everything. And are you using like a scraper thing or a brush or a bit of both? Or? Glue brush and then deli paper over the top and a brayer to really roll it out because I don't like wrinkles and I don't like bubbles and I find the pressure that I can get with the brayer takes care of that problem right for the most part yeah 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 that is that is interesting and I've got a uh, another studio shot here and I can see the wooden brayer at the end of the glass well I'm assuming that's what that oh the baron it. yeah the baron uh, yeah oh okay yeah interchangeable yeah, yeah. um and that's really interesting uh, I like working with the gel plate on the glass like that um, does really help a lot. I mean, it stops the plate moving around, but it is quite good for mixing up the the uh, paints there. Um, it is because I make yeah. a giant mess and the glass <laughs> is much easier to clean up than any other surface. 
yeah so that was going to be another question too like i often find people say oh is there any tips like i just find that i get glue everywhere on my fingers on the pieces i don't want like is, do you have any sort of work around go-to tips for keeping the glue where it's meant to go i think it was a tip from crystal neubauer that you use your old magazine and right. you glue on the old magazine and then move it over to your piece. So I always use that tip, but I can't work with gloves. So by the time I'm finished in the day, I have matte medium solid on both hands and then it's just <laughs> a question of peeling it off. So that's, I, I really don't have anything to save me from that. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. And, um, same like you know back in the day it was phone books and magazines and now I find I have a shortage of those or you're kind of using the magazine and thinking oh I might need that for some material and then it sort of goes to like the um you know the trash uh what do you call it like the trash junk mail, mail. Stuff, junk mail yeah. yeah that kind of stuff but then I find that doesn't even come into the house now that goes straight into the bin I, I do use a lot of um baking paper or grease proof paper because yes. yeah I find that doesn't stick to the actual thing and kind of use both sides and then start to fold it over and then it gets smaller and smaller and yeah. finally you have to throw it out yeah so yeah. I have started some of the books that I pull apart the ones that have the very shiny papers in them those work just as well as magazines so I'll keep the text blocks next to me and that makes me feel better because I'm recycling it even further than just uh, yeah, right. out when yeah. I'm taking, out, yeah. taking out what I want. At some point we have to let things go. Um, That's true. <laughs> and so then I guess uh, I'm jumping around with my questions now, but the other thing while we're on the sort of uh, process and workings, storage. Um, yes. Do you have go to, these are some of the lovely shots from your studio. Do you have a, um, go to way of how you organize all these materials you're collecting? I think like every collage artist, I find one method and then several months later, I have to change everything because I've outgrown the first method, <laughs> but I consistently, uh, the Ikea carts that you saw, yeah. I have a small fleet of those. Yeah, I love that fleet of cards. <laughs> How many can I fit in my studio? <laughs> so those are all stacked with the, the blank pages I rip from books. And I keep them handy underneath my, my letterpress because that's what I print on. Then everything else is color sorted into file folders or plastic bins. And I find that's just the easiest way to be able to move something to my work table based on what color I'm using. Yeah. It's still yeah. up everywhere. And there are still cardboard boxes and scrap bins and multiple flat files and archive. It's an ongoing constant system and there's yeah. never enough space for it all. And I guess, um, do you find sometimes if you, if it's not conducive to creating, then you can just go for sorting time or just um, something <laughs> yeah, yeah, because there's always a new material that's come in that I need to go through. So I'll often just bring a stack of books up into the living room, especially in the winter when it's cold, and just sit in front of the wood stove and tear things apart and sort them. And it's yeah. can be really relaxing. Yeah, that sounds lovely. And uh, so this can segue nicely into um, color color sorting. Um, so is that a mix of, it looks like I can see some frayed, is, what, what materials are you using in this one? I love that piece. Uh, that was all book covers. Mm. And I feel like the lighter pink might have been something that I dyed myself. Oh, yes. But yeah. I don't really remember because it was a long time ago. But then the, it's letterpress printed on top of the fabric book covers. Mm -hmm. And I love how you've got those sort of uh, straights and diagonals, but then in that top left, just that little bit of a wonky shape, just uh, yes. makes a little different. Then they're mirrored in the bottom right hand side of that too. Like just, yeah, it's yeah. a very balanced piece. Balanced, yes, I love that. And then going to um, this piece. So one of the questions I was going to ask was, do you ever make marks on top of the materials afterwards or are you only ever working with found uh, marks? 
I very rarely will go in like I did with that one and just with a pencil and make some marks. But that particular, the paper seemed to demand additional marks. <laughs> There's that damage on the bottom from the a bookworm. And I was very excited to find that paper. And then I just started collecting papers that were really damaged for the rest of the piece. And mm -hmm. that gave it all that texture. And then I added the pencil to push that even further. So I'd, I don't usually add paint on top of it on anything I make. The paint is just part of the collage papers. And mm -hmm. pencil is about as far as I'll go with adding any other materials to the finished piece. Mm, I love that. And I love how those um, little tiny pieces of text uh, become tone in a way. Um, and then, like I was saying in the intro, we do want to lean in for those details. Um, yeah. And so one thing, I mean, I'm looking at that with my particular um, lens of my background and all of those things. And so for me, I'm loving that uh, all that detail there almost in the center but not center so you know off center and then balanced out by that slither of dark um on the left there so do you kind of have compositional go-to strategies and is that something when you teach that you work with um students trying to explain how they might compose something yes and i, th I start with the grid and mm -hmm. that's how i learned when I took those classes from Melinda. And I find that's a great way to have students understand the connections from one side of the composition to the other. And I always come back to that in my piece, just finding how my eye moves from one section to this section to this section and how I can connect with similar pieces to move them through that journey. Yeah. And then playing with the differences to not make it super balanced, which I have a tendency to want my pieces to have perfect balance. But when I look back at my older work, they are really, really balanced. So yeah. trying to offset that a little bit now to make them more interesting. And yeah. Additional variety. But yeah. That's, that's so interesting. Um, and so that, that like, one that you have up now would be my other, uh, like the stripes, the abstracted landscape, just lining things up. That's also a, a, a strategy that I use quite often. Yeah. And again, so um, for those, I mean, it's fairly uh, self-explanatory, a grid being uh, that, but then also that, and then sometimes a combination of both. Um, so here we've predominantly got, you know, we'd say the vertical grid, but then the way that the turquoise doesn't always, doesn't completely go to the bottom, we've got that slight bit of horizontal grid um, coming into play as well. Um, and then the fact that they're not completely parallel is just, um, yeah, it just makes the composition uh, work that much uh work so well and then just the solid compared to on the left where we've got those torn pieces I mean all of those elements um yeah just so beautifully playing together yeah. <laughs> they're and just so, so much fun to make yeah right and I mean I think that I can hear the other questions like how do you know when a piece is completed I had I taught a workshop this weekend and one of the students asked that question and it just everyone had to laugh because we all are we get to that point and my answer was it's usually when I can't think of any other detail that the piece <laughs> needs to feel like it's balanced mm. and that there's that it there's balance but there's also enough dif difference to make it interesting and that's usually when I stop when I just step back from it and think okay that's good don't yeah. add any more <laughs> So going back to that, like balance but enough interesting, like if that didn't have, and I can't wave my cursor over it, but if that didn't have that um, thicker diagonal line that's to the right of the turquoise, like if you put your finger over that, that just then becomes a blank space. But the fact that it has that size of those thicker lines 
Mm -hmm. um, and then if we do lean in, we can see the music score um, underneath the blue on the left, which kind of then uh, mirrors that diagonal line. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, it's fabulously composed because it, the first when we first see it, it just looks, you know, just calm and simple, but then it just has those extra details, which, um, yeah, excellent. <laughs> well, I think you, I think the, the first detail happens accidentally because it just happens to be the paper that I pull out. And then the entire rest of the composition has to somehow make use of that detail in multiple places so that it hangs together. Yeah, yeah. I've got another one here too as well. Um, so like you said, this is probably another example of um, starting with the grid. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And that's this is, this is one of the compositions that I revised because it – it's on top of another composition. Initially, it was all letterpress with none of the, you know, the, the veiled fabric or any of the black text. And then I just didn't think it was interesting enough, so kept building another grid on top of it until it worked. Mm. Yeah, the the overplaying of the elements and also um, that mix of sort of. Uh, the contemporary green blocks and then with the vintage scrolls and the border in the top right um yeah having that interplay of those extra details so that um you have got something that keeps giving you know when you sort of are walking past it or um yeah you've got that extra um, yeah and then there's the handwriting that you can see that blood from a ledger page on the top left yeah so that was completely accidental and i just had to leave it so the, the materials often take over and do their own thing and I just have to adjust. Yeah, the material's taking over. I love that. Um, okay, so I've got another couple of, um, yeah, again, working with those uh, torn uh, folded elements. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we mentioned about the spaces in between and... Um, what did I, I had an actual question that related to that. Um, but did that sort of take a while to get used to working that way, like training the eye to work out what the space is in between and that sort of use of negative space? Um, is that something that you find when you're teaching just takes people a little, little while to train their eye to sort of see those spaces? Yes, and I think the, the grid helps to let them make that connection when they see how, one area can then relate to the next. So if they're working in like a three by three square to see the connections that can make from one little square to another to another. And that's how I figured out the relationship when working with text and how much more interested I was in that, uh, the ground rather than the figure. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, the background of what, what you're seeing there. Um, and so do you, do you have a preference of working square or, you know, portrait or landscape? And do you find one preferable or easier than the other? Or does it depend on the materials? I always put my paper portrait. And I'm, I don't know why, maybe just because it comes out of the book that way, if I'm working out of a, a watercolor pad. But I do like how landscape looks and I'm trying mm. to do more of it. I feel like mm. it just sprawls across the page in an interesting way. But most of my work does seem to be portrait. Mm. Mm. And uh, so I've got another piece. Oh, yeah, that was the one I had just had. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good example, isn't it, of the, the negative spaces, those spaces mm -hmm. in between and what's happening at the edges and the slices. Um, yeah. So interesting. And then there's something about square um, that sort of changes things up altogether. Like sometimes I just find that things don't work in a portrait and suddenly when you're working square, they just sometimes it just falls into place. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you ever find that as well? <laughs> I'm trying to think of I'm looking at all the examples I have. Um not really. I, I think it, I just work with a, whatever substrate happens to be in front of me. I just make it work. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think uh, we, uh, we were talking um, prior to this about um, that you recently acquired a typewriter um, yeah. so that you could make notes. Um, yeah, do you, is that something that uh, you kind of are thinking about, you know, typing up stories or things that can add another layer or dimension or was it just the appeal of the nostalgic and vintage? It was the nostalgia. I remembered learning how to type on my grandmother's typewriter and found one. And then I think through all of my vintage collecting ended up with lots of old typewriter paper. So mm. I had to have a typewriter to use the paper with, but also you can type on it, then I can turn it around to the blank side and that becomes part of a collage composition. So it might have my words on it, becomes part of a collage, but you can't read it. So it, it's just that story that keeps going. Yeah, 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 love that. Um, and uh, yeah, if you ever need to get anything out of the system, you can just uh, type it and, and bury it. Um, exactly. or to-do lists are much more fun to write if you are typing them yeah <laughs> so so about the click and the keys and not worrying about spell check it's really nice. mm. and uh i also feel like if we were live we might be interrupted every now not interrupted but we might pause every now and then for questions so here's a question i've just imagined we'd had um do you ever uh, get prints done of your work and do you sell prints as well as the originals I only myself sell the originals, but I license the originals as prints to a variety of places. So someone else handles all the printing for me and the shipping and the framing. I haven't myself sold any prints or made any prints of my work. Yeah, that seems like the perfect. Um, and so then are they responsible for the scanning of your originals in order for that to happen? Or do you have to get things scanned and sent to them? I either have to do it myself or bring it to someone who has a better scanner than I do to do the scanning. Yeah. And yeah. once yeah. I get that done, then that's the last thing I have to do towards the prints. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, handling that whole shipping and packaging yourself can just be... Um, yeah, which kind of goes to sort of my next question that often um, working as an artist can be quite isolating. Um, have you found social media and the internet helping or hindering that? And what's been your experience of um, both of those things in the last few years? I th social media gave me a community of artists that I don't think I would have found on my own. And once I didn't realize there was such a community of artists where I live until they yeah. found me on social media. That's so interesting. one just sort of fed into the other. And now I have all of these real life local friends who are artists through social media. So I, I don't feel isolated because they're all around me now and I can reach out yeah. whenever I need them and go have those in-person meetings. Yeah. And it just yeah. leads the social media just leads makes the connections that leads to the an interview like this or uh, a chance to teach locally, and it's been great. So I I know a lot of people complain about social media, but I don't think I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for it. Mm, yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, my kids are in their twenties now, but I remember when they were at uh, primary school and kind of if I ever did get to do the school drop-off, you know, you're kind of looking to like, how can I find the people that do what I do? How do I find them? And then you can't have that conversation like speed dating at the school pickup game. Do you do art? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you, are you an artist? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No. We're not all turning up with our berets and aprons at the school. Yeah. Uh, our outfits do tend to give us away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crazy hair. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, and in the intro, I mentioned about the um, that your abstract uh, typography stencil was part of the Stencil Girl collection, mm -hmm. which is fabulous. Um, could you tell us how, how that happened? I taught with, it was uh, the first Collage Makers Summit, and I wanted to show everyone how I, how they could create 
prints that looked like they'd been letter pressed, but on a jelly plate. Mm. I went to the craft store and I found the, the kind of stencils that you would have used to do a, a poster project when you were a kid. And so I demonstrated using those, but I was very unhappy afterwards with kind of, you know, the type that was available and how they looked. So I reached out to Stencil Girl, to Mary Beth Shaw, and asked her if I could design stencils that were truly based on letterpress prints. And she said, sure. So I found my favorite type and I made prints and I scanned it all and then played with it until I could create repeat patterns that looked good as stencils. And now I am able to teach with those and it's been really fun to see what people do with the stencils and how yeah. they can use them in their own art. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, I remember as a fan of the gel plate, um, getting that stencil, like the one that you would, you know, like a, you imagine spray on packing boxes. And, yeah, exactly. um, oh, yeah, it was so hard to get it to work. Like the idea seemed good. Like, yes, type on the plate, but it just aesthetically just wasn't quite. Yeah, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look like a handwritten letter or something that had truly been letterpress printed. So these, the stencils that I have now work much better and, uh, actually, do I have, can I show a sample? Yeah, sure. So this is one of my stencils. Oh. And it looks a lot like it was actually letterpress printed. Mm. Which and that is actually letterpress printed. Ah, yeah. Yeah, really I love that. Look to that vintage uh, poster feel. Yeah. And um, so in most, of, so are they on book pages, that paper? Uh, yeah, one's a stamp album and one is an old map from a book. Ah, yeah, but already like just in that slight glimpse, you can just know that the paper is yeah, a paper slightly somewhere. different. Yeah. And uh, what about the smell? Does that sort of linger or you just like bin those straight away if they're a bit stinky? Um, I don't usually, if it, I don't usually get it if it's really smelly, but sometimes it happens anyway, and I'll just leave them out in the sun for yeah. a week or two, and that lets the smell disappear. But then once I start working with them and add enough layers of matte medium, I, I don't think it usually smells, but I have been told by people who have picked up my collages that they do smell like old paper, so... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that just adds to it. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And um, so going back to that, do you have to uh, like extra varnish them or anything to seal them as well as doing the matte medium? Is that something that you feel that? Has yeah, I, I worry so much that they're going to fade uh, that once they're out of my basement studio. I put, I seal them with more layers of medium and then multiple layers of a UV varnish to protect them as much as I can. But I also tell people when they buy them to not put them directly in the sun or yeah. there's a good chance that they're going to fade even more, which could be interesting to see how yeah. the, the papers age yeah, uh, as they were intended to, but I'd rather they not. <laughs> Yeah. So in something like this, um, is that sealed as well as framed? Or if it's framed, it doesn't need sealing? Or I would, de it's definitely sealed. To, okay. to put it under a UV protectant glass would be even better, but it is sealed as well. Hmm. 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 Interesting. And uh, so oh, here was a sort of uh, another question. When you enter into the sacred studio space um do you ever find it difficult to focus or like um I tend to be a bit like that sometimes or do you have like a ritual for when you walk into your space or do you just like hit the space and action straight away um let's see I have to turn on the lights and the space heater and sometimes I'll light incense but usually I'm so excited to be there that I just dive right in I yeah you know, I know what I want to start. I have the paper that I want to start with, and I, I'm just really happy to be there. So I, I don't want to waste any of the time that I have. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? I remember reading a book once about um, someone who'd interviewed a whole lot of artists that happened to be mothers. And so that was the point of the book, talking about the experiences creating uh, from the point of being a mother. And I guess talking about the, when the children are young and just saying that those people tended to be quite focused during those years because their time was so limited. So they really appreciated. Uh, yeah, that, that is uh, very true. Uh, when I first started collaging, I had a little table up in the living room and my son would get home from school and I'd get home from work and he would play or watch TV and I would sit at that table and use every minute I had to make something. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's probably part of why now I still jump right into making whenever I have time because I've trained myself to yeah. not procrastinate yeah. and to get right to yeah. work. And of course, you know, it's not um, uh, just confined to uh, women that have happened to have children, because I think anytime we all now appreciate time as being precious. So, um, yeah, regardless of the situation, uh, it can be that thing about valuing and just making most of that creative time because it's not always a luxury or something that we can we can have. So, yeah, we do appreciate it. Um, so wow, the time as always has just um, flown by. I knew this would be fun, like chatting about paper and glue and process. Um, so what are you working on at the moment or what are you looking forward to? So I've been using my the map books that I got and peeling my maps and my fabric apart. And the collages I've been making from those are inspired by Japanese Boro textiles. Oh. And then I found out that there was something called Japanese uh, Boro paper, where they would save paper the same way by just gluing, gluing, gluing all of these pieces of used paper. So that's been what I've thought about as I've layered these new pieces. And there's a yeah. lot of a lot of softness to them, and of course indigo is the the main color for them mm. and so as the layers uh stack up can we do you still see or are they like the bottom layer, layer completely buried or is it just um no it's hard to see the layers this way i don't even know which way this is supposed to hold but some of them you can see a little bit of the text underneath. It depends on how much fabric I used. The lighting yeah. right now doesn't help, but uh, some of them, the fabric is so thin that the layers, you can definitely see the layering and the text and the maps and all the things that I, that I put underneath. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's completely covered up. And so that is a mix of fabric and paper, the fabric mm -hmm. being from the back of the maps rather than textile fabric that was exactly. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm, I'm just imagining. And so um, is that like a series or exhibition or you're just kind of processing, working with that kind of uh, theme? And it turned into a series. I made one as an experiment and the first one, it I didn't, Things were still wet and the entire piece slid off the panel, as you were talking about earlier, things just completely failing. So I peeled everything apart and then glued it back on. And that got me thinking of Boro textiles and just yeah. reusing and repurposing. And it went from there. So it's turned into a series because of one early mistake. And um, for people that uh, may not be familiar with your work and want to follow where this goes, um, is this something that you have on your blog, website, or Instagram, or where can people um, see the progress of the borrow textile? They haven't been, I've only hinted at them in my newsletter. I haven't shown yeah. any of, besides the first piece, I haven't shown any of them, but they will be on my newsletter and my blog and on my website, uh, and of course, Instagram at some point. So I'm getting there, yeah. I'm getting ready to yeah. review them. And uh, being of the words background, um, yeah, so it's an informative uh, newsletter. So, um, yeah, oh, I encourage you. people to sign up if they um, want to find out more and hear more about the world of collage. So I think, yeah, I've come to the end of all my things that I needed to <laughs> interrogate, I mean, chat to you about. <laughs> well, it was fun. I love talking about my process and my materials. Yeah, yeah, it's so, so beautiful. And um 
yes, you know, something about working with the repurposed materials and then like that nostalgia and then coming up with something new with all of those things, I think is always going to be appealing. Um, and thank you so much for, um, yeah, just the generosity of information and all the things that you've talked about and shared with us today. I'm sure people um, got lots of um, things that, to, or they can go back and watch and make notes. Yes, and I'm always happy to answer questions. Yeah, yeah, because um, it can be fun. Like, yeah, just uh, go beyond wanting to stick things in the middle or stick mm -hmm. things in the middle on a diagonal and just think about the grid, people. Exactly. Think about the grid. Start with the grid. Um, thank you, Sarah. It's been amazing. Um, I'm going to play our exit reel in a second. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, yeah, we love doing these and uh, getting to visit artists all over the world and sharing them with you. Yes, so thank you. And uh, let us know, everybody, um, uh, thoughts, comments, and questions, and we'd love to hear from you. Bye from us and bye, Sarah. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.